On this episode of True North, we'll journey across the frozen tundra to meet three generations of Sami, the Arctic's native population, who are fighting to preserve their livelihood as reindeer herders and reclaim their indigenous rights. We think of the Arctic as uncharted territory, but long before the first explorers were here, one indigenous group, the Sami, had been making the Arctic their home for thousands of years. For a baby, my name is Nils Peter, and I am a Sami reindeer owner and herder. And me and my family, we work here with reindeers. This is our summer pasture in North Norway. My name is Veska Neljas, and I'm from the valley and I was elected the leader of this Norwegian Sami Association. We work with Sami Parliament and the Sami Council and also in the UN system. My name is Ken Even, and I come from a reindeer herding family. I work with reindeer and I've done that my whole life. Oh, they're very sweet. The region the Sami inhabit is called the Sampai which includes the northernmost parts of Norway, Finland, Sweden, and Russia. Reindeers used to be everywhere in Europe when there was the Ice Age. But when the ice started melting, the reindeer followed the ice up here, and so did our ancestors. It starts 11, 12,000 years back, where they were living a hunting and gathering society. And this was the animal that they used to hunt. Right, because the Sami used to just follow the Yeah, herd. just following the herd and hunting. And then late 1500s, early 1600s, territorial claims by Norway, Sweden, Russian, you're paying taxes to three countries. You can't be a hunting and gathering society anymore. And the modern reindeer husbandry, as we know today, starts where you start owning reindeer instead of hunting reindeer. It's a rough area and the reindeer was what kept these people alive up here. The reindeer does not need us, I don't think so, but we definitely need them. This is the most fantastic meat ever, the reindeer meat, and we'll grill it on the fire. The island of Arnoia in northern Norway is home to about 3,000 reindeer during the summer months. The reindeer season starts when the first calves get in birth, in the beginning of June. Then the reindeers are all the summer here at the island. In a couple of weeks, the reindeer start the migrations to the winter pasture. They will swim across the sea. To the other island over there is Gabir, and then they walk over the Gabir. Then they swim from Gavi to the mainland. We follow the reindeer's rhythm. It's about 300 kilometers to our winter place, so it takes a month. In November, December in the Arctic, it's dark. But we only have three, four hours with daylight. And it's outside the area of telephone contact, so we're working like 20 hours in, in darkness. We do what we have to do to be with our reindeers. It's not our job, it's our life. It's not an easy lifestyle. You're moving around constantly, and the environment is harsh. You have blizzards, there is snow, it's rough. In my home village, minus 40 Celsius degrees is normal winter temperatures. That doesn't mean you can cuddle up by the fireplace and read a book and drink some hot chocolate. That means you're outdoors, working, looking after your animals, making sure that they're safe, making sure that they don't mix with other herds. And if you don't do it, then yeah, you're without a job because they will disappear.
Indigenous people in the Arctic, like the Sami and the Inuit, of course, they have a tradition to live in rough conditions with snow and ice, so they are very used to it. And the polar explorers understood that the indigenous people in the Arctic have a lot to teach them about how to survive and travel in snow and ice. On his first expedition crossing Greenland, Nansen brought two Sami with him for their Arctic expertise, Samuel Balto and Old Ravna. So tell me what we're in right now. In my language, it's Launi uh, Launi is turf, so it's a turf hut. It's cold in the summer and warm in the winter, so it's uh, really, really nice. Well designed. It's well designed. Imagine when the kind of age of explorers was happening in the 1800s and then onwards. There must have been things that they looked to the Sami to teach them about surviving up here. Yeah, of course, the clothes were uh, most important, I think. The first thing they got themselves was uh, Sami clothes. This is from my area, this, this cacti. This is made from every kind of material. Traditionally, with this uh, leather, we make from reindeer hides. Can I feel it? Yeah. And then we have the winter clothes to keep warm. And also the shoes. You stay These really are, warm with those shoes. These are kind of amazing. There's obviously a special way of like going in the direction of the fur. Yeah, it has to go both ways, so you won't slip. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're just head to toe in reindeer yeah. in the winter. Reindeer hides have uh, this hollow hair. It's adapted to the Arctic climates. That's the importance of reindeer. We can make everything we need to survive from a reindeer. How many Sami families still just herd reindeer? I think there are around 2,500 registered brands, so you have the cuts in the ear. Oh, I see. But how many work professionally is, is, is hard to say. So you learned how to take care of them and what they're like and their nature from your parents. Yeah, so you follow your, your mother and your father up in the tundra and they kind of teach you the names of the mountains, lakes and the rivers. And then they start teaching you more about the reindeers. There are a lot of Sami words to describe them and distinguish them out from a herd with 10,000 reindeers. Really? For instance, that female over there, she has a white nose, which mm. is Kalpenyunni. But that might not be enough to distinguish right. it from a <laughs> herd. So you'd have to maybe describe her antlers as well. Our language, it's insanely rich when it comes to nature and snow and reindeer. Right. Isn't the word for herd derived from the word for life? Ellu is a herd and elit is to live. So I have here dried meat. Okay, it's like jerky. Reindeer jerky. So you can rip. You. When you were young, protecting the herd for the first time, did you ever have to deal with predator attacks? I've seen predators going for the herd, but then we've been there so they will turn around. Like wolverines? Wolverines and eagles in the summer. Oh, really? The eagles kill a lot of reindeer. The babies? They can kill a big one as well, it's no problem. An eagle can kill a wolf, so what match is a reindeer? But natural predators are just one of the threats facing reindeer these days. I also have uh, seen the climate changing. When it's warm in the wintertime, it may be raining, then it's getting like ice layer on the snow. The reindeer find the food on the ground, and when it's getting icy, it's like you put a lock on your refrigerator. You know it's food there, but you can't reach it. Those things are the first markers of an unstable climate, and it's very real. It's, of course, an economic challenge to have to feed extra food, and also it's an ecological disaster when you are not able to feed all the reindeer and the reindeer starve. And threats to the reindeer's grazing lands are posing another set of challenges. Sometimes the reindeer come down from the mountains and into people's gardens. I see. So they adapt and learn to eat new stuff as well. And so the herders won't come and try and find them? In the summer area, you, you leave your reindeer alone so they get time to graze. If you start driving after them all the time, they eat less. As cities expand, the Sami lands and herding areas are being encroached on more frequently. But this phenomenon is nothing new. Much like the Native Americans, the Sami were subject to cultural discrimination and oppression. Assimilation politics of the governments, their goal was to erase the culture and to make every Sami person a Norwegian or Finn or Swede. And they really succeeded in that. It was quite hard politics. They didn't come with soldiers to kill the culture. They came with teachers and priests. The Samis had their own uh, religion. They believe on the nature gods. Late 1700, 1800, Western people came up to the north 
then they want to um, Norwegianize and Christian the Sami people. Christianity, in my opinion, it has quite the opposite basis of life than indigenous peoples used to have. Indigenous peoples are part of nature and, and Christianity says that man is above nature and nature is for him. So to embed that mindset over hundreds and hundreds of years all over the world have maybe created the world we are now. One of the most controversial practices was the introduction of boarding schools, which removed Sami children from their families. A friend of mine's parents used to talk about the assimilation process. Some of the kids, they were living in border schools and it was illegal for them to speak Sami. They had to use Norwegian. There was a girl in the class that was asked to tell Father Grace by the teacher. She was telling it, the words were perfect, everything was correct. And then the teacher says to the kid that she should go into the shame corner. And the other kids in the class are asking, but why? She knew all the words, everything was right. Yeah, but God does not understand Sami. And what is this? Is this referring back to when the assimilation was kind of being pushed? Yeah, it's the border schooling. But on Swedish side, there was this uh, nomadic schools. They had this politic that the Sami people should stay and be preserved as a nature people. They, mm -hmm. they are not to develop. They want to just hold them there right. in the traditional culture, like some museum. Uh. And they weren't allowed to come to regular schools. Throughout the Arctic, the self-determination of the Sami people was jeopardized. It was a little bit sad for the Sami history. In middle of 1900, we almost lost the language. But the reindeer Samis, like my parents and my grandparents, they were just avoiding them because they had the reindeers they could avoid them. They, they just went up to the mountains and they knew they, they couldn't come up there. While the northernmost reindeer Sami were able to preserve parts of their culture, 10 of 11 Sami languages are critically endangered or extinct. Like some stupid people say Holocaust never happened. There are some stupid people saying that this never happened. So today actually the Norwegian government has started a panel that is going to investigate this and it's going to be in the open. But the Sami people's interest isn't just in talking about the past. The Sami culture has been experiencing a reawakening. In the 70s, the Norwegian government wanted to build up a dam in a small village called Masi. And the original plans were to flood the village. So this made a lot of Samis go on a hunger strike outside the Norwegian parliament. <laughs> And from that fight, we got the Sami parliament, we got more momentum, we got more rights and, and acknowledgement from the government. They, they, they can't continue to oppress our way of life. Can you talk me through a little bit about the issues that you're fighting on all the different fronts, environmentally, politically? Right now I'm working with this uh, activist group called Ellosteatno. Norway and Finland has decided new fishing regulations for our watershed and we lose rights to fish traditionally and they give rights to tourists. Tourist fishers must therefore ask permission from the Sami people of the Tietno Valley and especially... We have managed our river system and fishing ourselves for thousands of years and then the governments now suddenly come and say you are exploiting your river so we have to come in and fix this problem. We have reclaimed an uh, island and we declared that in this area those new fishing rights or any Norwegian or Finnish laws doesn't apply there. Both governments, they don't really know how to deal with this. So they don't? Do they consult you? Yeah, yeah, they consulted but they didn't care our opinion at all. Now people of our valley, Dietno, support our work. People actually now think that, yeah, of course, we should rule this river ourselves, like we always have. It's an awakening because it has been so many hundred years with foreign oppression and ruling that that's just a state of mind that this is how it is. And if eight, nine thousand people rise and demand that, then the governments, uh, they just have to back up. We are fishermen, we are reindeer herders, we are handicrafters, we work in offices, like every other person. But what upholds the culture, it's the traditional livelihoods. So those are really important to protect. Older people in Sami, the veterans, they don't get retired. They are like our Google. 
We can ask them about everything. They teach our kids what we do and how we do it and why we do it. Growing up as a reindeer herding kid, it, it's, it, it's perfect. You grow up without many rules. You're very much outdoors. It's very free. And you get to learn how to make fires. You get to use knives. You're kind of making ready for survival. I very much would like my kids to have something similar. Learning about Sami culture was eye-opening. I heard about the indigenous groups that live up here in the Arctic, but I never really had a concept of what their lives were like or what their history actually was. So when I was meeting with, you know, Sami leaders and reindeer herders, it was just fascinating to actually see how not only are they very knowledgeable about all their traditions, but they're re-embracing it now and fiercely kind of protecting it and conserving it. What I see is the most uh, dangerous thing is that Sami people also get uh, caught up in this system and, and just becomes exploiters themselves of our lands. So that's a, a danger. When you don't know your culture, you won't take care of it. Eating here on Svalbard, you notice a lot of meat and a lot of fish. Uh, you got whale and seal and reindeer. What vegetables you have have to be shipped or flown up from the mainland because of course we're here in the Arctic where most vegetables don't traditionally grow. But that might be about to change. I can take some of these. My name is Benjamin Vidmar. I'm the creative director and the founder of Polar Permaculture, and our goal is to grow locally grown food and to make longer being more sustainable. Gracie, how are you? How's it going, dude? Got some greens for you. Thank you, sir. My name is Graham. I'm the sous chef at the Svalbard Hotel. We got you some radish, some yeah. amaranth, and some peas. Very nice. We've been getting our greens from Ben for about a year now. It's the only source of fresh greens on the island. Having fresh product in any restaurant's good, especially up here. All right, cool. See you later, Grace. Sure. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Of course, in the beginning, it was very difficult to have any type of proper nutrition in this place. It was whatever people could bring, and you can only bring so much. Meat and potatoes is what most of the people have been eating, not so much vegetables, because everything is frozen, and here it's really tough to get good food. I can never get used to that, so that's why I started this project. So this is the lab. We kind of experimented with many different things here. I'm not a botanist, I'm just a chef, and I'm a foodie. So this was my attempt to have the freshest food possible. The only thing that you really can get cheap are alcohol, tobacco. If you want to <laughs> eat good, you have to donate a kidney or you have to, you know. Yeah, to or eat a kidney. <laughs> or yeah. eat a kidney, yes. I was just so frustrated with the quality of produce and vegetables that was coming up, and it's so expensive. To get anything on the flight, no matter how big, it's a minimum of 1,000 kroners. You got a lot of things going on here. What sort of experiments are you running? This is our main business here. We call them microgreens, and you've probably seen them before. This is radish. Oh, wow. Uh, peas, amaranth, and I believe this is rucola. We sell these to the hotels and to the restaurants here. We sell one tray for 300 kroners. In an ideal world, I'd love to be able to get everything grown here. If you could grow carrots, cabbage, potatoes, fresh produce is the best thing for a restaurant. And they really like it because you see it looks very beautiful and ours oh, they yeah. last like one to two weeks. And we focus on this because this only takes one week and we deliver. So this has been our main crop. I ordered a hydroponic machine from Italy and I started to grow all types of things. I was growing tomatoes, edible flowers, salads, and it just evolved from there. And then for example, I had to order fertilizer. It was like 10 liters and then 25 pounds to ship it. So how is it helping the situation if I'm just shipping up fertilizer? The main thing for us is to compost what we get back. So before we deliver a new tray, we have to take back the old tray. Mm. You have the old ones for me? I, I can take the old trays. Yeah, I have lots of old ones for you. So we get this back from the chefs and they use what they can use and then sometimes it molds. So it would go into something like that. And then what happens is we have worms here. It took like one and a half years to get permission to have these worms. Oh, hey, you see all the mixed up vegetation? Yeah. yeah. So you see them, they're all in oh, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But these are not like earthworms. These are 
red worms. And these ones, they don't dig so much. And that's why they gave me permission because they had this researcher at the university, he had to actually write a paper about this. Because really? like, it's an invasive species. But his conclusion was that they won't naturally survive here because it gets too cold yeah, for them. Too so cold, yeah. well, then it evolved from there. Then I just wanted to see how many circles could I create. And that's when we started this whole circular economy thing where we wanted to make the resources last as long as possible before we send it out somewhere. You know, for us, it's important to make these closed loops. And that's what permaculture is all about. The ethics are earth care, people care, and fair share of the resource. This cardboard is a waste product. Mm. Here, this is considered garbage. We ship this back to the mainland. It's a lot of shipping. And we talk about climate change. We actually have the highest CO2 output per capita in the mm. whole world. So I told them, we don't need to ship this back. This can be processed here. Our worms, they break it down. They need this kind of carbon. And then it turns into the verma castings, which we, we use for the bigger plants. Now we've added another step to this solution. So recently we just hatched some quails. <laughs> and the whole point for us to have the quails is that we Cute. want to have eggs. Mm -hmm. So we can turn these worms, because the quails, they really like it. You see? Oh, wow, yeah. He's, they really like the he worms. crazy for it. <laughs> so as soon as the eggs come, we wash them, we put them here, we deliver to the hotel. So you can't get any fresher than that. You're a mile away from the most of the places you'll be delivering to. If yeah. that, LA upstairs, just one upstairs. You have a little police system. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> eggs, please. <laughs> Coming up. <laughs> yeah, and so if there's less shipping back and if there's more things being produced here that don't need to be shipped from the mainland, maybe you can cut down on all the CO2 being I produced agree. by the big I cargo totally ships. Agree. This place was set up like a colony, basically. All of the resources are extracted, sent somewhere else, and then they're sold back to us in a different form. And so now they're changing all of that. There's a focus on local food, because everybody wants it. We want this to be like a normal city. So now they're making the laws where we can buy local fish, we can have greenhouses, we can have all of these things. It's coming now. This was the first project of its kind. Mm -hmm. Careful, because the wind's gonna push it. And like when I said greenhouse, everybody was thinking like a glass rectangular building. Yeah. And I didn't think that that would do very well. Like there's two glaciers there. <clears throat> We're in a valley. The wind comes through here like a wind tunnel. And I wanted something that was proven. Not only is this to grow, but it's a landmark. Mm -hmm. You can see it from just about everywhere. Yeah, yeah we've noticed that. <laughs> in the dark season, we have these LED lights and it makes it like a purplish color. And it lights up this whole side of town and people yeah. love it. It's a two tier. So on the bottom is the compost. We added all kind of vegetable waste and everything. And you can see one screw, you can open it and you can turn it from the bottom. And eventually, hopefully the worms and everything will make this into a decent place where we can grow a lot of stuff. And it looks like you're growing a lot of different types of vegetables. We have a lot of radish. We had uh, mustard we planted, tomatoes. We had a lot of peas, maybe four or five towers. And we harvested all the peas and it was like a full bag. And then we walked into a restaurant, said, do you want these? Yes, give them to us. They just, whatever we can produce, they want. So if we can grow it, they will buy it. Yeah. And so what about uh, weeds and predators and other things like that. Yeah, well, it's been really tough. We've been having some problems with aphids. In any other place, people will say, well, if you have too many aphids, then you have a shortage of ladybugs. And you just add ladybugs and they will start to balance that out. But we don't have that luxury here. Because yeah, if I want to bring ladybugs, <laughs> I have to import it and then I have to get permission. And here, we don't use any chemicals and it's really challenging. I'm happy that I did this project here, even though it was very hard and it was much harder. The conditions are yes, way rougher. But I have a bigger reward. It's good for everybody. In five years, I'm hoping that we can grow a huge percentage of the produce for the town. The whole history of this island has been extraction. We started with the whales, we hunted all the whales down, then we start trapping all the animals on the island, and then after that we start extracting all the coal. Now the coal is done, and then what's next? You have the fish, you have the crabs. I wanted to give something back, and this project is really the only thing that's focused on giving back. While Ben's focus was bringing new foods to Svalbard, the island's original cuisine had to be hunted, not grown. From reindeer to seal to whale, what's available this high north is both limited and unusual. To try some local fare, we headed to Husset, the world's northernmost fine dining restaurant that boasts one of Europe's largest wine cellars. Oh, wow. Hello. Hi, Hi, Philip. Hi. Hello. Nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. I was born in Sweden and started my career there, and then I moved to England. Uh, so I worked around in many uh, Michelin-style restaurants. Yay. I th <laughs> this is going to be one of the hardest parts of the expedition, this I think. This is really hard. <laughs> <laughs> Just fall hard. Cheers. So I uh, pretty much cook 24-7. When you get something you haven't ever touched before, I find that super exciting, yeah. to be honest. It's, uh, it's why I'm here. This is a Svalbard reindeer, tenderloin, which we have uh, very quickly seared and um, cold smoked. 
and we're gonna serve that with pickles followed by mushrooms, lingonberries and uh, garlic chips. We're trying to bring out what we actually have here in Svalbard, which is obviously not that much. It makes me work a lot harder and be a lot more inventive with what we got. There's not many people who has this opportunity that I do, and I'm very grateful for it. This is the most beautifully presented amuse-bouche I think I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. In my personal life, I am a pescatarian, but for the purposes of respecting the culinary tradition of this place, I am going to be eating meat during this meal. Mmm, it's tender. We're trying to be very playful with what we do and give our guests something a bit unique that you don't get anywhere else. I want to present what's around us. I think that's the most important thing, apart from the actual food. So ideally, we wouldn't serve anything that's not from here. It's a small bar mushroom soup with a smoked Sylvester bottom cheese foam. Simple as that. Ooh. Bottoms up. Clink. Mm. Oh, wow. Mm. It's like a cheesy oh. soup. Ooh, but then mushroom. Oh my god, that's good. Yeah, that's, that's really, really good. good. As a chef, it gets very boring when things are too easy. This is kind of a challenge in a good way. You kind of learn to love food in a different way. Cheers. Mm-hmm. 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 It has its challenges. We never know when we get what we get. I was planning a dish for quite a while with Arctic Shark, but I couldn't catch any. And then three days later, someone catches an Arctic Shark. You have just enough to get through one service, and it's gone again. Ooh, it really smells of the sea. Like the ice and the kelp. It's yeah, amazing. It's Liver of reindeer. So here we got a blue cheese mousse with a bit of truffle inside. Fill up in this little pastry rolled in leek ashes, served on a piece of coal. This is insane. In terms of the presentation, this is one of the I coolest things I, I've ever been is, served. You don't want to touch it. We're gonna, though. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Oh no, what have I done? We're so messy. That's amazing. I do feel like every time I bite this, it's gonna cinnamon challenge <laughs> my mouth. How much would I have to pay you to try this charcoal? No. <laughs> I don't do that. Why not? It's not food. Yes, it is. It's like when you burn stuff on the barbecue. Yeah, it's like if you burn something on the barbecue and then put that to the side and then ate the charcoal. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Svalbard bearded seal. It's called the 10 minutes boat ride from where we are right now. With a bit of local sorrel. One of the very, very few herbs <laughs> that grows around here, very acidic. I've never had seal before. No, I haven't either. I'm sad and I'm scared. We have to remember that going back many decades to survive here, People consume the animals that were nearby. It tastes so cute. Stop saying cute. <laughs> Do you feel dirty? A little bit. Are you gonna self-flagellate like the guy from those damn brown books? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jerusalem artichoke, cream fresh, and hazelnut ice cream. I can't believe this is here. I know. <laughs> There's a mountain just over there where we can't get like phone signal and there are bears. <laughs> you can eat fine food in here or you can be fine food out there. <laughs> so this is Svalbard called Cod that we actually go out ourselves to catch every week. And we're probably gonna have this on the menu for another couple of weeks before the cod goes away from Svalbard again. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Get out. That's good. Uh-huh. We're doing these multiple courses and there's uh, champagne and wine with each and they're not doing like big pours or whatever, but I already feel it. I'm buzzed. One last swig, baby. Here we have the famous Svalbard reindeer, topside, with a bit of chanterelle puree and butter poached cabbage. Oh. I feel strange about it, because we just were filming with a reindeer earlier today. Yes. They're very sweet. But in terms of sustainability, they said there was something like 14,000 Svalbard reindeer. Mm-hmm. It's really good. This wine is too good for both of us. <laughs> oh, clearly. I think she understands that more than anybody. Oh, my God. There's a trolley of cheese coming straight at us. I don't love cheese. <laughs> My estimation of you just went skyrocketing down. That looks like an entire meal right there. Wait, 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 wait. We're supposed to be on this course, but you've still got this big old glass of red wine. I am Thought five the inspiration foot would be two. <laughs> so you're gonna have some. <laughs> guys gotta do what I got. guys gotta do. This is how you're supposed to eat it. 
Not many people know that with Norwegian cheese, you're supposed to pour some off for your homies. This is for those we've lost along the way. <laughs> people here are classy. We need to get it together. When she put all this cheese down, she knew it was too much cheese. She knew. She's an expert. This is her fault, not ours. Have you had that? No. To who said? To who said? I'm hammered. So that's like the cuisine of Svalbard, an updated high dining version of it. But you have the same sort of base ingredients of seal and whale and reindeer and all of that. Um, you combine that with a lot of wine and uh, it's a pretty good evening. We have three more courses, by the way. What? Pre-dessert, which is an ice cream made out of stout from our local brewery. Get ready for the pre-dessert. Is the pre-dessert like a shot of morphine? That goes together with a almond and coffee crumble. Mmm, mmm, mmm. That's good. Oh my god. You're way smaller than me. Yeah, but I'm not a <laughs> That's a good point. We start with a cloudberry brulee. So a bit of shortbread, puree, cloudberry ice cream. I don't know why you're refilling that. <laughs> oh my god. This is for the haters who don't get the Arctic. Okay, you don't understand it. You think you do, you don't. Okay, you never been a small I can do this. Mm -hmm. It's too much. I'm gonna die. You're acting like you're in the mines. We are eating dessert. Like, it's so hard. Oh no. Oh my god. No, we're not worthy. Yeah. What? <laughs> What's happening? And then she just leaves it. <laughs> I just want to go to sleep. This bud is crazy. I'm hammered. <laughs> no way, good night. <laughs> Feed me to a polar bear, I'm done. <laughs> Kirkenes is one of Norway's Arctic port towns. It's only home to about three and a half thousand people, but it borders Russia. And last year, hundreds of Syrian and Afghan migrants started coming over the border seeking asylum. By 2014, the war in Syria had caused thousands of people to seek refuge in cities across the globe. Despite its remote location, the Arctic town of Kirkenes, Norway, saw a massive influx of refugees, more than 5,000 in a town with a population of only 3,500. Local residents Marete and Randy wanted to help. My name is Randy Snevashaya, and I've been working with refugees through the organization Refugees Welcome to the Arctic. For me, it started when I was watching the news from Syria. It was a nightmare. I, I f felt so bad for all these people. And then the Syrian refugees came over the Russian border here in Kirkenes. And I was sitting at home like, oh, I have to do something. What can I do? What can I do? My name is Meret Norhus. I'm an activist in Refugees Welcome to the Arctic. Behind us here, we call it a Kompetanse Center where the refugees uh, go to uh, learn uh, the Norwegian language. They also learn general things about Norway. We help them find homes and introduce them to everything we have here. Around Kikines, I can definitely see a mix of people. Yes, Sami, Finnish, people from Africa, lots of Russians. Of course, after the war in Syria, we have lots of Arabic people here. Has it always been like that? Uh, yes. The tie between the polar regions and refugees isn't new. Polar explorer and national hero Friedolf Nansen pioneered international policies on human rights for refugees. After the First World War, Nansen became engaged in the refugee situation in Europe. He wanted to do something, and he also believed he could make the difference. After the borders were drawn new after the war, there was many people that didn't have proper documentation. So Friedhof Nansen created a document called the Nansen Passport, which afforded citizens left without countries legal status. He became the first high commissioner for refugees in the legal nation. And for his humanitarian and peace work, he got the Nobel Prize in 1922. But empathy for refugees runs deeper than the legacy of Nansen in Kirkenes, a city that faced its own crisis during the Second World War. Kirkenes was the second most bombed uh, city in Europe in, during the World War II. And after the war, I think about four houses was left standing. So they had to rebuild the city really fast. And that's why you see 
the shape of the houses here, they look the same, square boxes. It's all post-war. We are grown up with these stories from the war. So even though I did not experience the war myself, I can imagine how it must have felt. It was in last September 2015. It was getting cold, the winter was coming, and my first thought when I saw the pictures of them on TV, they had no winter clothes. They, were, they looked so cold. Children bicycling in very cold weather, they had uh, like almost nothing. And my heart really broke. Hello. Hi. Can we come in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey Mustafa. Hey. Jij hebt de Rana Anter. Jij komt in Norge toe tussen of hanten november. Did you know where you were, like how far north you were going? Altri. No. <laughs> Never. <laughs> I don't think they knew where they were. It seemed like they just packed their bags and went. Når jij komt in Norge, jij bod in Eden. Det är inte så länge för här. Och det var väldigt kallt. Och när vi vill köpa ting, vi kom till kyrkan i här. När jag träffade med några människor, jag var med Mustafa här i byen. Och sa till Mustafa, hur den människor här kan... I thought the same thing. <laughs> How did you even find out that you can get a visa to Russia and then from Russia you can go to Norway? När vi fick väldigt vanskelig i Syria, jag började att tänka vad jag må göra och dra till Syria. Och plötsligt jag sa till Mustafa, jag må dra nu. Men min bror i Ryssland sa till mig att jag kan höra att det är någon väg från Ryssland till Norge och det är safety. Brukar ingen båt, yeah. då kan du Lots of the families with children, they took this Arctic road as we called it because they did not want to go in the rubber boats and risk their children's lives in these dangerous boats. It was safer through Russia. Rana's family traveled from Damascus in Syria to Beirut, Lebanon, then flew to Moscow, and finally Murmansk in northern Russia. From there, the family employed human smugglers to drive them to the Norwegian border. I feel very sad for my family to be sick. Norway is going to be for 3.5 Och så det chaufför chauffören i min bil var väldigt snäll. Han så jag att jag är väldigt rädd om andra familjer i andra kar och gjorde mig slubb av lite för de vi vi de tog cykla och flit cykla med oss med stor van och de var inte vanliga människor. Jag följer att vi med mafia rill. Now you can see the first sign, customs. We're getting close. The Russians have a law, you cannot cross the border into Norway walking. So that's why they came on their bicycles. And they paid lots of money for the bicycles. Here's the Schengen border. We would be in uh, lots of problems if we try to go any further. This is Rana's first, first trip to the border. Here since she crossed it. When you were here, was it snowy? All oh. white. We put a cover over the cycle. Yes, just go and hold it. It was really difficult to, to bike on snow. With your suitcase balance yeah. on top. And her suitcase. And they had their whole life with them. In one suitcase. Were you nervous? Because it's a border crossing and it's very strange. You don't know the rules, you know? Mm -hmm. Very nervous. Men jag hör att asylsaker har i Norge väldigt god. Inte samman i Tyskland, för exempel. Crossing the border was a relief, but it didn't bring an end to the family's hardships. The small city of Kirkenes was struggling with an influx of refugees that nearly doubled its population. We were not prepared for this at all. Not 
my city and not Norway. Far from you, dear. Hmm. The the land. For the Eitrur, we saw what was in Syria. Also, Norway come. The Eitrur at all verden har og vi trenger vi tror at vi skal ha immediately opholdstid. Yeah, local people started talking about this. A lot of gossip, of course. What will happen now? Why are they coming here? I think they tried to do their best, but it was chaos, of course. So many people came every day, and these children and these human beings. It's not good for them to be in that camp. And then they started to send people back. They sent one bus with 13 single men back to Murmansk. And then we heard the next day they were deporting families with children. I think that that time at Yeyes can be very difficult. And so after that, they came to us and said, Du och din familj ska tillbaka till Ryssland och din dotter ska bli i Norge. I Norge är jag följer så glad om att ska inte bo på ingen. Men jag är lite chock när jag bor i Tyskland och oss bara tillbaka till Ryssland. Så eller accept om mig och inte accept för familjen min. Och vi följer, vi förstår inte vad, vad sker med oss. Vi är i Norge och vi må, vi må bli i safety place och vi, vi förstår ingenting. They kept the refugees in that airport camp before they were being deported. It was a closed camp, no one could get in. We were outside the camp, it was about minus 30 degrees. We didn't care, we had to be there because we didn't believe that it was happening. How could Norway do this to these people? We drove up to the airport camp and this Syrian family came out. Mother, father with three children and they got in my car. The police officer came and he said to me, you are not allowed to go anywhere with this family. And I said, why? Are they under arrest? What are the charges? Give me the documents. <laughs> and he said, no, just stay here. Don't go anywhere. It was really an impulsive act. I just wanted to help them. I did not know what I was going to do with them. I just saw the mother's desperation and I thought I have to do something. They had put police cars to try and block way out of the camp. But I just drove past the police cars, <laughs> heading towards Kirkenes with the family in my car. I just drove. I had the police after me, and they managed to stop me before I reached Kirkenes. But we were all arrested, and um, I spent uh, three, four hours in jail, and I was fined for trying to get them out of the camp. I'm so happy we managed to stop the deportations. Because after the day we got arrested, they did not deport anyone back to Russia. It stopped. So I'm really proud of what we did that day. This Syrian family, they got their residence in Norway eventually. And now they are living in the south of Norway. I haven't seen them for six months now. I miss them very much. They call me their guardian angel. So. I get emotional just by talking about it. <laughs> Central to the history of Kirkenes is a mining tunnel which the entire town lived in for months during the German occupation. We call it the Björnavan tunnel. They used it as a shelter during the Second World War. About 3,500 people lived in here for some weeks. I'm just telling him I've never been here before, so it's very interesting for me to be here. Yeah. Finally. They took their belongings and they also took their animals, the cows, sheep, and moved into this tunnel. They did not know for how long they had to stay here. It was their home for a period. Here you see these uh, wooden gates that have been here. They had bunk beds going like three or four. I read an interview with uh, 
a man who lived here and with his parents, and he said it was like living in a big market. Children and, and, and animals everywhere, and people cooking and trading food and everything. Ronnie, you were telling me that in Syria, under the city in Damascus, they have shelters like this. Yeah, the ikam bara de nom tunnelar de massa massa tunnelar under var by de anna by it's really um, strange to be here yeah. to think that 3500 people lived here it must have been so tough and outside, I mean, this was a front. It was being bombed and mm, everything. Yes. How long were they down here until the Russians liberated? The Red Army came here, freed Kirkenes from the Germans in October 1944. They didn't know that war is going to end in, uh, or uh, that the Russians are coming here. The war could have been for two or three or four or five years. So, uh, mm. I'm sure they were preparing themselves to live yes. here for longer than that. Yeah, sure. During the Second World War, Kirkenes was the next most bombed place in the whole world. When you know how it is to really feel helpless and you have nowhere to go, I think that has formed us in a way. This has been the story of our grandparents and this has been the story that they passed on to their children and then to us. It's very interesting for me to follow them integrate into our society. They're learning to speak Norwegian. They find jobs. They have lots of Norwegian friends. They get their driver's license. They buy cars. I'm amazed how well they adjust in our society here. Before they got their residence in Norway, I said to Rana, I pray to God that you will get this, my municipality. Yeah. And she called me one day and, and she was like, you cannot believe me that I got that letter and we got your municipality. Mm -hmm. We're coming to live in Kirkenes. <laughs> and we were crying, oh my God. Is it true? Yeah. I'm glad it worked out like that. The best thing her minister her. He contacted me with it and then they were very vanskly when we began her in Norge. And they were all letter. For people that have never been to the Arctic, it probably seems like this really inhospitable place, but actually it's a place of lots of very tightly knit communities where outsiders, they're welcomed, and it's definitely a place where you can sense Arctic hospitality. Philip, thank you. That was like one of the best meals I've ever had, honestly. Yeah, that was amazing, man. That was incredible. It was like a whole journey. I just hope I remember most of it tomorrow. <laughs> Cheers. To being in a country with socialized medicine and pensions. <laughs> Is the light getting brighter? It feels like it. If you come to Husit, don't come around. You need to come correct.